In this video, we're going to be recapping the latest episode and all the new drama from 90 Day Fiancé the other way. So let's get to the crazy couples, Stephen and Alina. This week, we learned that when Alina wants some intellectual conversation, she turns to stray cats. My best friends in Turkey are cats. <laughs> So Alina is starting to get concerned that despite their engagement, there's still no real progress on the marriage front, even though their visa to stay in Turkey is fast running out. After taking a very well-earned break from babysitting Stephen, Alina decided to have a serious conversation. And believe it or not, it turns out Stephen's having worries about Alina's baptism. I'm worried that, you know, right now you say you want to be baptized, but after we get married after we move to Russia that once you're back home that you won't want to be baptized anymore. You see, at the time all of this was being filmed, the Mormon church weren't doing any baptisms in Turkey, and Stephen, being the good Mormon boy that he is, he wants Alina to be baptised before he says, I do. Crazy, right? He's the one with the trust issues, even though she's a better Mormon than he is. Oh, the irony. I couldn't help but laugh when Alina, in sheer frustration, is like, why don't you believe me? What do you want from me? A signed promise that I'll get baptised? And Stephen, semi-jokingly, although kind of seriously, like you just know he'd have loved to have done this. He kind of jokes about writing a contract with her promising that she won't change her mind and she will indeed get baptized. Yeah. I trust Maybe you. Maybe I I'm... should write somewhere and sign up just <laughs> then you can show me this paper and and say yes you promised see. That's a pretty good idea. Do you want to do that? <laughs> the good news is, if they're going to write a contract, at least we know that there's an empty page in the Book of Mormon he gifted her last week. <laughs> okay, and mm -hmm. you, do you still want to sign that piece of paper? Oh man, what a guy. Speaking of which, I've seen a lot of chat online about how Kenny and Armando's storyline this season has been really boring. And look, I don't disagree. I think especially in comparison to the insanity that is Jenny and Summit or Stephen and Alina, Kenny and Armando aren't the most riveting. Like in the last episode, all we had from them was Kenny's daughter and grandson flew out to Mexico a few days early ahead of the wedding, which he loved. And Armando was worried his dad wouldn't be coming to their wedding. But guess what he actually is coming so i get it it is a little boring but and there's a big but coming here there's recently been some huge revelations off screen about armando's deceased ex-wife hannah's mother let me explain so a bit of background here armando was married to his partner for eight years at the time of their separation and as it turned out the time of her death his ex was actually pregnant with their second child and the way she died must have been so traumatic for the entire family i can't even begin to imagine as armando explained in an ig post quote during the divorce proceedings and on the evening of her passing, a disagreement took place over finances and I thought it would be best to leave the situation and return back to my home. After that, 15 to 20 minutes later, I was driving down the highway and I was shocked when I was suddenly struck from behind and then was hit again. I then realised it was my ex-wife and before I knew it, she lost control of her vehicle and passed away on the scene. As you can understand, this was a very tragic event in the life of my daughter and I as we lost her and unborn baby. This was a very difficult moment for everyone involved, myself, our family, our friends, and has been a long grieving process. And out of respect for my daughter's mother and her memory, I ask for your empathy and understanding on this personal tragedy. Wow. That announcement kind of changed everything for me. I went from being in the, this is boring, why are they on TV camp? To, hey, I'm so glad this is boring because more for Hannah's sake than anything, like Armando volunteered to be on TV. I'm guessing Hannah didn't have much of a say in that. So for her sake, I'm glad her dad and Kenny aren't involved in all the cringy scenes from this season. Perhaps it doesn't make for great TV, but boring for them is probably the best thing for all concerned. One couple this year that I've got very little time and patience for is Corey and Evelyn. Given that we know they'll do anything to stay on the show, 
They'll even lie about their marital status, which is the entire reason the show even exists. There's no real surprise that now they're back together. Evelyn has forgiven Corey's cheating, although if rumours are to be believed, she's allegedly also been cheating on him. There's been no mention of that on the show. But yeah, their marriage, their whole relationship, it's built on very shaky ground. So what did Corey have to do to win back Evelyn's love? <laughs> well, he cooked her breakfast and he gave her massages, it seems. Giving me massages every night. I still need to continue doing that. That's the basis for any great marriage right there. This week, Corey decided to propose to Evelyn again, and let's just say he could probably do with some proposal tips from Stephen because Corey's proposal was a bit of a letdown. What does it say though? I see my name, but I don't see anything else. Now, it definitely seems like Corey's Spanish is improving. If you remember, that was one of the things that Evelyn wanted him to work on. So kudos to him for that, if nothing else. But can anyone tell me what's the deal with Corey and his very sorry looking flowers? Someone tell the guy if he's trying to impress a lady, spend a few bucks, Corey. Come on, you can do better than that. Anyway, moving on. This week, we found the one man who can tame Sumit's mum, the family astrologer. This guy seems to have a mythical magical power because knowing how much devotion and faith his parents have in the astrologer, Summit finally decides to bribe, I mean, sorry, to invite the astrologer to talk with his parents. And the astrologer is happy to tell Summit's mum and dad some home truths. Like, it's not your job to teach a lady who's older than you how to do housework. And the penny finally drops. <laughs> Based on the astrologer's advice, Summit's mum finally understands that she needs to back off. She needs to let her son live his own life. And that's it. After nearly a decade of opposing the relationship, Mama and Papa Summit decided to have a heart to heart with Jenny. Tell her that now, thanks to the astrologer, they finally understand that this is all destiny. It's written in the stars and they are willing to accept the relationship. But destiny or no destiny, written in the stars or not, don't push your luck, Jenny. They are not willing to give you their blessings for the marriage. So, can Smit and I marry? Now, there's a lot of symbolism in this episode. There's a lot of hints that we're about to embark on a fresh new start. You've got Summit sweeping up when, during the infamous kitchen scene, he didn't even pick up a broom to help. About time you start sweeping. <laughs> then we've also got some more symbolism with the whole Indian festival of Holi, which apparently symbolizes peace and acceptance. Even Summit's mum explains how she's burning away her bad feelings about Jenny and the fire. And look, it very much seems like there's been some real progress. But I'm telling you, this astrologer, he needs his own show. Or maybe Summit needs to learn how to pay him a little bit better when he comes to bribing him, because it turns out behind his back, off camera, we find out that the astrologer has been telling Summit's parents that they basically need to call his bluff. Closer ji ne mere ko bola hai, agar tum jada piche padoge to ye isse chhodega nahi bilkul bhi. To maine soch liya ki main chhod diya main. And it's at this precise moment when Jenny comes back from the conversation with his parents and tells Summit they no longer object to their relationship. This is when Summit realized, oh dear, I'm screwed. And that's when he's forced to start coming up with some new excuses and fast. Things are happening very fast. I never even thought about my parents will gonna agree on that. But it's happening, so or you can say that I didn't plan for the next step. So now we can marry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Are you ready? Like, when are you ready? How soon yeah, do you want? Yeah, whenever you want to get married, whenever stars are, want us to get married. How soon? I don't know. Like, it's maybe a... I don't know. <laughs> You can't make this up. He doesn't know what to do. He's found himself in a pickle because, as he says, he's only had nine years to plan for this day. <laughs> So what now, Summit? What should we do? Oh, let's just rely on the stars. The stars will tell us when to get married. 
You know what that sounds like? Another costly bribe. Mr. Astrologer, please, please tell Jenny the stars won't align for at least another five years. <laughs> Just look at Summit's body language throughout this whole scene. I know they're covered in colourful powder to celebrate the Indian festival, but look at his hand behind his head, constantly touching his neck and even stroking his hair. According to a former FBI body language expert, quote, neck touching and or stroking is one of the most significant and frequent pacifying behaviours we use in responding to stress. And, quote, head pacifying through stroking the hair signifies a need to pacify during emotional discomfort, as a parent might do to a young child. In other words, Summit's stressed out right now. Thanks to his parents following the astrologer's advice, he's now found himself trapped in a difficult situation and he doesn't know the way out. He can't blame his parents anymore for putting off the marriage, and it looks like he's not sure what to do next. Now, speaking of stressful situations, let's move on to Aryan Binyam. So, after last week's ultimatum that she wouldn't be returning to Ethiopia, Binny flew out to Kenya to reunite with Ari and Avi and Ari's mum. Before flying out though, he tried to have a chat with his sister Wish about the claims that she was the one who told Ari he'd been spending lots of time with other women. But unfortunately, Wish was apparently ill. And so his other sister admitted that Wish had indeed been speaking to Ari and basically they were all aware and concerned about the partying and Binny's behaviour since Ari left. Now, reading between the lines here, it did very much sound like there may have been a falling out between Wish and Binny, and that she told Ari perhaps out of spite. At least, that's what Binny seems to be hinting at. Either way, the fact his own sisters are concerned about his behaviour means Look, Ari does have a point. She's not just inventing all of this. Something is not quite right. Something may well have happened while she was away. Now, Binny maintains he hasn't cheated and there was definitely some cold, awkward vibes when the pair finally reunited after months apart. But cold vibes or not, nothing could have prepared Binny for what was to come the next day. Ari decided to lay everything on the table and confront Binny and she hired a translator to ensure that there was no communication issues. Now, I get why she hired someone, but come on, I felt embarrassed for the lady, getting dragged into the middle of all of that. Binny clearly didn't want her there, and it was quite funny how he was responding in English and clearly understood everything that Ari was saying. I think instead of hiring a translator, they probably would have benefited more from hiring a relationship counsellor. So what was the result of their conversation? Well, to be honest, not much. Binny is very defensive and he denies cheating, but Ari's confrontation style is doing her no favours. She levels accusation after accusation against Binny, like, why didn't you answer your phone? But then, instead of listening to his response, she just bulldozes all over him. She's starting like a nice way, nice way, and then you mean to me. Okay, I don't want to stay too long on this topic no. because I would like to go and move on to the next thing. Okay, next thing. Because... Nothing is shame, just what are you, what are you thinking? May I, may I finish? Like, if she doesn't let him answer and explain himself, she's never going to get to the bottom of it. She just needs to shut up, let him talk, because if he is guilty of something, he's probably going to end up tangled in a web of lies and she's going to catch him out. But she can't do that if she acts like this and she just shuts him up, shoots him down, and she's clearly at the moment just not ready to listen to him. So yeah, that's where we are. Ari really does seem to have a lot of empathy for Binny. She bursts into tears at the thought of depriving him from his son because of what he'd previously been through. And whatever you think of her or their situation, I respect her for that. Right or wrong, the truth is it would have been a lot easier for her just to have stayed in America and not gone to Kenya. So just by the virtue of the fact that she's there, even if she's not quite ready to forgive Binny yet, I think they will be able to work their way through this. Now, whether or not they should, whether or not this is a good relationship, well, that's a video for another day. Maybe we can have that conversation in the comments. So there you have it. That's my take on this week's episode. What have I missed? Or is there something you disagree with? Let's continue the conversation in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, show your support by hitting that like button. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing for lots more 90 Day Fiance videos. Thanks for watching. Catch you on the next video.